Well, uh, in the uh, last lecture, I tried to just make a few suggestive remarks in order to get us off the ground about uh, uh, what might be called uh, the, the uh, Greek way of life and different forms of human conduct, of which only one uh, I suggested and discussed, and that was the Socratic life of inquiry. And I didn't mean by that life of inquiry an inactive life, an apolitical life, or one unconcerned with the state or with other humans. But in fact, I wanted to present it not as some academic debate, but as a life deeply immersed in your social situation and in your attempt to understand who you are and who your fellow citizens are. Uh, among the values that, uh, that Greek society held out and in a, as an answer, one possible localizable and possibly usable answer of what human life is about for the Greeks was to sum it up in one word, and this will be all I'll have to say about Aristotle or Plato, uh, is excellence. In a way, it's well known that the Greeks have an ideal of excellence, where by excellence the Greeks meant something like this, to be an all-rounder, you know? It's in sort of West Texas parlance, an all-rounder. Somebody that, you know, could write a country song, punch out a big guy, shoot a game of pool, work a full day's work, and was smart enough to read a thick book. But, uh, and I, I don't mean to make it too mundane, because if you look at the description of Odysseus in Greek literature, that was sort of an ideal of excellence in their culture. And it's not like our ideal, because Odysseus was, one, a clever liar, Two, someone who would cheat the gods when, necess when possible and necessary, uh, who could drive a furrow, throw a discus, sail a boat, you know, and a bunch of things, right? And so for the Greeks, excellence was a whole series of traits of human beings, well-rounded in all respects, so that uh, some of the Greek, was, uh, one of the great Greek tragedians was buried, and his marker remarked on what a great soldier and orator he had been, but said nothing about him winning the prize for the plays for which we know him today. So the Greeks had an, this idea of, of excellence, which to us can only be a pale shadow in a society where we mean something so radically different by excellence. By excellence, we would have to mean, and perforce have to mean, an excellent lawyer, an excellent politician, an excellent housewife, I'd rather say worker, a rex an excellent house worker. It's hard to say worker when they're unpaid labor, but house worker and so on. But excellence in a society in which labor is greatly divided can only be, as it were, a pale shadow of this Greek ideal, okay? Uh, that doesn't mean that you can't be excellent at your job and learn to ski, but the Greeks meant a bit more by it than that. So what we'll pursue now in a discussion that unfortunately has to be far too brief will be ideals of excellence in, in a Roman society, and I'm going to run through those. Some of them are fairly well known to us today, so I'm going to run through a few of those ideals of, of human excellence. Again, localizable to the, to the Roman Empire. Again, very Western, you know, all traditional, don't, no problem there. And then I'll end with a little intimation of something I'll try to pick up on again at the end of the lecture. Uh, even though Christianity as a form of belief dominated Western civilization for so long, I'm going to have very little to say about it at the, in the early part of the lectures for a reason I'll give you toward the end of this one. Okay, so now uh, to move from the Greeks to the Romans, uh, there are three different views I want to discuss in terms of how to conduct one's life. And uh, two of them bear a nice historical parallel with conditions in the Roman Empire and its fight. Uh, one of the positions with which uh, many of you are familiar, at least in name, because the word, although it means something slightly different today, this position is probably familiar. Uh, one of the answers to how to live, given during the rise of the Roman Empire, when the markets were filled with goods and there was much to enjoy, even for some of the plebeians, there was much to enjoy because Rome was looting the world. Uh, uh, maybe some of you understand this condition from your experience, I don't know. But anyway, uh, it was a good time philosophy. It was hedonism. 
Now, it's important to understand that philosophers uh, of the old school make a living refuting hedonism because how could a view about what is the best kind of life for humans or the right thing to do, and I'd like to make this simpler by just using Spike Lee's phrase, how could do the right thing mean do what makes you happy? But actually this view is harder to refute than one might think because in answer to the problems of life, the hedonist response that you should do what makes you happy is actually a fairly powerful view, I think. Now, I think that it's more powerful under conditions where it's possible to do that for obvious reasons. Now, the, the hedonists back up their arguments with two kinds of claims, and we'll return to this again when we get a kind of modern form of social hedonism in John Stuart Mill. But the hedonism of the Roman Empire was uh, was uh, uh, connected with various schools, the Epicureans and others, where we get the word Epicure. And that ought to already tell you something about the kinds of pleasures to be pursued. And this will be disappointing to many of you. The kinds of pleasures the Epicureans wanted to pursue, and, and nearly every version of hedonism makes this distinction, were the higher pleasures, by which they meant the ones that don't have the negative payback. The higher pleasures are, as the word Epicure indicates, excellent food in moderate quantity, like swordfish steak, just right, blackened a little, yuppified, just a little, little picante sauce, which has become quite popular, Tex-Mex variant. Just enough, though, to be healthy, good for the heart, a little running, and these things in moderation. A little learning, but not too much, not enough to trouble the mind, but enough to satisfy it. On the other hand, one wouldn't indulge in those pleasures that have a, a strong negative side. I mean, this is the way that the, the philosophical position is. Myself, I've always wanted some hedonist to just come out and say, I'm for the really gritty, ugly pleasures. I like them. But that's not a view. You know, I would defend partially that view, but that's not a view that, that, that is you know, philosophically respectable, although it, it may be even more plausible. Now, the lower pleasures are things like getting dog drunk, which provides a lot of pleasure until the next morning. You get a lot of pain. Falling dumbly in love, which provides a lot of pleasure and then gives a lot of pain. These were to be avoided because they led to a troubled mind. So those pleasures were, as it were, not this was a very rational position, say. The idea is to maximize one's pleasure, so you follow the most rational course to do that. You go after higher pleasures that don't have a, t a bad downside and avoid the so-called lower pleasures that have this downside. A good drunk, uh, uh, again, our culture is familiar with this, just say no to drugs. Well, the reason for that can't be that they don't make you feel good. You know, I'm an, I'm an old 60s person and I know better. They make you feel good, but they have a downside. So I'm not, I'm not arguing, don't, don't charge the stage. I'm not saying say yes to drugs. I'm just saying you'd be a fool to say they don't make you feel good. They do make you feel good. Just get, you ought to be, tell the truth about some things once in a while. Hell, it won't hurt. Even in Reagan and Bush's America, it doesn't hurt to tell the truth once in a while. Just don't get caught by your friends, okay? Uh, in any case, uh, uh, the problem with drugs, though, is they have this downside. You know, the, the cocaine blues is a familiar, not only country song, but phenomena. Way up, way down. This view of seeking pleasure was quite widespread in a period when Rome had a lot of pleasures to seek, booty from all over the world. During the decline of Rome, a rather different uh, view of the best kind of life for human beings arose, and I'll discuss it briefly too. And uh, then we'll compare them, because the comparisons are interesting. And that's Stoicism. And just like hedonism still means something like hedonism to us, when we call someone a Stoic today, it still means something like what they meant by it, Stoic. Now, it's important to see that there is a connection between these modes of beliefs and the social and historical conditions that people are actually responding to when they form these beliefs. 
So when less booty is available in Rome and Caligula's wasting a lot of it anyway,